Contested Bones, Part 9. We've been discussing the book Contested Bones by uh, Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, the, uh, a little more information on it is available on the internet, and uh, it is available from various sources, including the uh, uh, original source as well. The cover of it looks something like that. Uh, Christopher Roop is on the left, John Sanford is on the right, those are the authors. And um, the prologue, in the prologue, John Sanford uh, relates that he believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized the impotence of evolution and the impact of what he calls genetic entropy, what might also be called devolution, the, perhaps the opposite of evolution and then had cognitive dissonance with all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes. Um, devolution means that species can't live for millions of years. They should disappear. And, uh, and yet, supposedly, there's all this fossil evidence that apes kept getting better and better until they became people. And um, so, he, being a scientist, decided to investigate and got Christopher Roop to help him. Chris Roop did most of the work. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles, basically setting the stage. Um, chapter two discusses the fact that the textbook picture, which follows Darwin's expectations, is straight line evolution. You get a little less ape, a little more human, a little less ape, a little more human until you get to a modern figure. The field is now widely acknowledged to be more like a bush with branches going in all different directions and there are some that state that the ascent of man itself cannot be traced. Almost all of the fossils are contested and uh, we see that in the subsequent chapters where he argues, uh, or they argue, that Neanderthals are humans, and uh, Homo erectus is human, and Homo floresiensis, uh, I misspelled that, uh, or the hobbit is also human, and um, Australopithecus afarensis is an ape, and uh, Ardipithecus ramidus is an ape. And last week, we discussed that Homo habilis is a mixture of ape and human, that is, it isn't an actual species according to many authorities, not just according to Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, and that being the case, um, we're going to look today at Australopithecus sediba, which they raised the question, is this another mosaic spe species? And the quote on, in the front is, it's not everything the rumor bill said it was going to be. It's not a missing link. And that's going to be important when we uh, sum up at the end. The uh, muddle in the middle is what it's entitled, uh, the first part of it. And this actually sets the stage. What it says is that all of the other stuff that's come before um, really doesn't give you a good ape to human pro progression. And that includes Homo habilis, which a lot of people think is not really, uh, doesn't really fit, okay? Until recently, the only evidence supporting the evolutionary translation from the genus Australopithecus to the genus Homo consisted of very limited fragmentary remains that have been hotly contested within the field of paleoanthropology. Evolutionary paleo experts have openly acknowledged this in an article published in Science in 2015. This was relatively recent. Researchers wrote, our understanding of the origin of the genus Homo has been hampered by a limited fossil record in Eastern Africa, the region where 
humans allegedly evolved from, between 2.0 and 3.0 million years ago, which is apparently when the transition was supposed to have taken place. This leaves a thin scatter of isolated, variably informative specimens dated to 2.4 to 2.3 million years ago as the only credible fossil evidence bearing on the earliest known populations of the genus Homo. Which isn't much, very credible itself, but you know, it's best you got. A National Geographic author similarly writes, the birth of our genus has long been a conundrum for paleoanthropologists to say the least. Only a few scattered and fragmentary fossils older than two million years have been argued to belong to the genus. And notice it says have been argued to, they're not even sure. And evolutionary paleoanthropologist and director of the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University, William Kimball said, there are only a handful of specimens. You could put them in a small, into a small shoebox and still have room for a good pair of shoes. <laughs> Izzy, you have Homo, you have the apes, and uh, the middle is just missing, really. Experts in the field freely confess that after a century and a half of collecting hominin fossils, the origin of Homo remains clouded. This critical transition period during which humans are said to have evolved from an ape-like Australopith is described as the muddle in the middle or the murky period. It is out of those few broken bones that paleoanthropologists have endeavored to assemble credible transitional species that link apes to man. The absence of credible fossil evidence in this crucial part of the ape to man story seems to have come to an end, seemed to have come to an end, with the recent discovery of the bones dubbed Australopithecus sediba, or sediba. Sediba is by far the most complete skeleton recovered from this critical time period. While only 40 to 60% of two skeletons have been recovered, yeah, 40 to 60% is considered really good. There are also bone fragments from four other individuals. This entire set of bones has been boldly promoted as representing a new species that bridges apes, Australopithecus, and men, Homo. Oh, I'm sorry. And there's, a, I don't know, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, 40% is probably closer. Sidiba is considered unprecedented in terms of completeness. Scott Simpson, anatomist from Case Western Reserve University, was involved with analyzing Sidiba's remains, comments in Science Daily. Paleoanthropologists are used to being fed scraps of fossils. But with Sidiba, it's like a, a feast, getting a skeleton of this magnitude. After a lifetime of crumbs, it's a welcome meal. To paleoanthropologists, a skeleton that is nearly 50% complete is considered a feast. There's still not much there, yet huge claims have been made about Sidiba. Some suggest it may be the biggest discovery in paleoanthropology in recent history. Although, as we'll find out later, mm, not so much. Background and discovery of Sidiba. The Cradle of Humankind World Heritage Site of Gauteng province, South Africa, is well known for its wealth of early hominin fossil remains, including those belonging to Australopithecus africanus, Homo ergaster, otherwise known as the African Homo erectus, as well as Sediba. On the 15th of August in 2008, nine-year-old Matthew Berger was chasing his dog along an open pit, which we're going to see shortly, referred to as the Malapa site on the Malapa Nature Reserve. Um, when he stumbled upon a bone uh, protruding from a clump of sediment. And we're going to get to see that bone sticking out, and it turned out to be collarbone. There's the collarbone, I think, right there. Um, and there's the pit. To the amazement of his father, paleo expert Lee Berger, he just happened to be a um, paleo expert's son. The bone belonged to a partial skeleton of a child who was about 12 to 13 years old. Excavated remains of what was later found to be an adolescent male, dubbed Malapa hominin 1, or MH1, included a skull, mandible, portions of the upper and lower limbs, ribs, vertebra, hip, hip fragments, and elements of the hands and feet. You saw the photo. 
Uh, nearly a month later, on September 4th, Lee Berger discovered a second specimen belonging to the same species. The remains were of a different, uh, of an adult female, dubbed Malapa hominin II. There's a nice little story about how they stumbled into a sinkhole together. <laughs> um, bones recovered included the mandible and teeth, much of the right upper limb, portions of the lower limbs, ribs, vertebrae, hip fragments, and nearly complete right hand and a complete right ankle, and one metatarsal bone. Since then, at least four other specimens, MH3 to 6, have been found, two infants and two adults though not nearly as complete as MH1 and MH2. For example, MH4 consists of a single tibia. 26 additional putative hominin bones have been recovered but do not seem to fit with any of the skeletons just mentioned. Uh, to date, only MH1 and MH2 have been fully analyzed and described. Um, a limestone deposit that underlies the fossil bearing strata where the specimens were found was radioactively dated to 1.9 million years old using the uranium thorium lead, yeah, I know, method. See chapter 12 on details for dating methods. These findings were first published in 2010 in Science, but with later papers being published in 2011 and 2013, describing in detail the remains of MH1, MH2, and the tibia or shin bone of MH4. Berger and colleagues claim that Sediba may be the best candidate yet for the immediate ancestor of our genus Homo. Sediba would take Habilis' position in the family tree and dethrone Lucy and her kind as our direct ancestors in the process. As you can imagine, Donald Johansson was not amused. Uh, National Geographic reported on what could be an extensive redrawing of the family tree, writing, everybody knows Lu Lucy. <clears throat> for nearly four decades, this famous partial skeleton of of Australopithecus afarensis, dated to 3.2 million years ago, has been an ambassador for our, I like that term, uh, has been an ambassador for our prehistoric past, and her species has stood as the most likely immediate ancestor of our own genus, Homo. But in a spate of new studies, paleoanthropologist Lee Berger of the University of, of the Witwatersrand, you may have run into that named before in the book, and a team of collaborators have put forward a controversial claim that another hominin, Australopithecus sediba, might even be closer to the origin of our lineage, possibly bumping Lucy from the critical evolutionary junction she has occupied for so long. The taxonomic classification of sediba and its proposed status as our direct ancestor is a subject of continued debate amongst paleo experts. Donald Johansson, discovery of Lucy and her kind afarensis, is adamantly opposed to having his species replaced by Sediba. Berger's suggested revision of the hominin ancestral lineage leading to our genus Homo is shown below. And uh, you can see that, um, I guess Sediba is close, more closely related to Africanus than afarensis. And this is, of course, Lucy. And then you get to Homo habilis or Sediba. Where Homo umbellus has its own problems, and then you get to what's essentially Homo, pure Homo. So, what is it about Sediba's fossil remains that would cause some evolutionary paleoanthropologists to abandon the standard story regarding the early ancestry of man? The scientific uh, literature consistently dis depicts Sediba as a mosaic of primitive ape-like bones and more modern human-like bones. New Scientist offers a typical description. At two million years old, they showed a mix of features, some similar to the ape-like Australopithecines, others more like our genus Homo. To its discoveries, this hodgepodge means a sedima was, was becoming human. The researchers and authors of the papers in science describe sedima in the same way, exhibiting a suite of Australopithecus-like features and Homo-like features representing a combination of primitive and derived characters. The researchers routinely make a clear distinction between the primitive and derived characters. That is, none of them are like halfway in between. Ape-like and human-like, respectively. For instance, the narrow upper rib cage of the female specimen is noted for its obvious resemblance to large-bodied apes, <laughs> whereas the lower rib cage is described as human-like, indic indicating to them 
a rather unsuspected mosaic anatomy. The explanation for this blend of traits is that some bones evolved to look more like Homo sapiens, whereas other bones remained unchanged and ape-like. Uh, they refer to this as mosaic as acquisition of modern anatomies. In other words, evolution allegedly operated in such a way that it appeared as though Sediba was an assemblage of two different species, belonging in separate genera. Uh, they misspelled separate. Australopithecus and Homo. A short description of Sediba's remains in New Scientists recognize this, stating, A Sediba has a strange mix of human and Australopithecine qualities. Some say that if the various bones had been found separately, they would have been assumed to belong to different species. Hmm. This was first noted by Stephen Churchill, evolutionary paleoanthropologist at Duke University and co-author of a number of the papers published in Science describing Sidema's remains. Churchill notes, if we found the specimens as separate parts, we'd probably think they came from different species. He writes, if we found them as separate parts. Actually, most of the remains were found as separate parts. Only a few of the bones were found in anatomically credible association. The site consisted of a mixed bone bed of many different types of animals. Most of the bones were not found physically connected to one another. Thus, it is possible that Sediba is not a legitimate species, but maybe a mixture of bones from more than one species, as was the case with habilis. We discussed that last week. As we shall show, there are multiple lines of evidence supporting this view. Uh, Sediba's spine and jaw appear to be mixed bones. The two partial vertebrae columns assigned to Sediba, 23 presacral vertebrae and a partial five element sacrum were described by Williams and colleagues in science as having evolved in a mosaic fashion. Many aspects of the vertebra had distinct features that are present in modern humans, longer lower back, wide curved sacrum, S-shaped spine, etc. However, other respected evolutionary paleo experts could not help but notice that some of the vertebral bones appear to be distinctly ape-like. This led them to believe that Sediba is not evolving in a mosaic fashion, but is actually a mixture of two different species. This would mean Sediba is not itself a new species, but is a mixture of ape and human bones. Evolutionary paleo experts Ella Bean, um, that'd be interesting, probably Bayan or something like that, but, and Yoel Rock, both from the Department of Anatomy and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University, presented their findings at the Paleoanthropology Society in Calgary, Canada, in April of 2014. A brief summary of their fi findings has also been published in New Scientist. Uh, I see I don't, didn't raise that. Uh, it's 32 there, figure five. Um, and that's a, uh, uh, something in the book itself. Bean is an expert in uh, spinal anatomy and pathology. After examining photographs taken of the fossil remains assigned to MH1 and MH2, Bean noticed that the lumbar vertebra of the adolescent male, MH1, looks strikingly similar to those of Turcanoboy. Turcanoboy is a Homo erectus specimen with lumbar vertebra that are wider than they are tall, just in mo as in modern man. On the other hand, the f adult female's lumbar vertebrae resemble those of apes, being similar to Australopithecines, which are taller than they are wide. According to our analysis, the spinal column of the two skeletons represent two different hominid genera, Australopithecus and Homo. We compared these ratios in the four lumbar vertebra from Malapa to the ratios that characterize the lumbar elements of 75 modern humans, two Homo erectus specimens, and four Australopiths. Our measurements indicate that the lower vertebra attributed to the Malapa specimen MH1 fell within the, uh, the, well within the range of Homo, whereas the lumbar vertebra attributed to the Malapa specimen MH2 are similar to those <coughs> found in Australopiths. Bean realized that the 
the remains discovered by Berger do not represent a single species. Instead, the remains belong to two different genera, Homo and Australopithecus. Being concluded, the claim that a Australopithecus sediba represents a transitional species between Australopithecus africanus and Homo stems from this mixture. The coexistence of Homo and Australopithecus in early South African sites is not unusual, as is seen in fossils from Swartkrans Cave in the nearby Sterkfontein Cave. Consistent with these findings, Yul Rock found that the unarticulated lower jawbones are also of a different species. The male jawbone, MH1, appears to be most similar to an Australopith, whereas the jawbone of the adult female resembles that of a human. So the female has the jawbone of a human and the back of an ape, and the uh, male has the jawbone of an ape and the back of a human. That's what you call really mosaic uh, evolution. In noticing the thinness of the lower jawbone, Johansson notes, it's homo. And of course, Johansson's biased because he doesn't want anybody to dethrone Lucy. Um, in agreement with the human looking jawbone, the dentition attributed to MH2 is described as remarkably, remarkably human like, lacking pronounced canines characteristic of Australopithecines. Paleoanthropologist Daryl de Reuter, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, author of a number of the science papers pr uh, covering Sediba, reports that the premolars of Australopithecus Sediba plot within the range of Homo erectus and Homo sapiens dentitions, with mandibular molars that are small, similar to specimens attributed to early Homo. Sediba's hip bone is human. Certain features of the human-looking hip bones, such as the sagittally oriented, oriented ilia, serve as the basis for the researchers' claim that Sidiba walked upright like humans, though with a pigeon-toed or hyperpronated gait. The researchers acknowledge that Sidiba's inferred ability to walk upright was based primarily on the hip bone and lower limb, as well as the commingled vertebra, which we discussed previously, and to a lesser extent on the pedal, morphology of MH2, which apparently was more ape-like. If it were not for the human-shaped pelvis, it would be difficult for the researchers to claim Sidiba walked upright. However, the human-looking hip appears to have been mistakenly combined with Australopith bones. This is likely considered the mixed bone bed from which the fossils were recovered. The hip bone fits neatly within the genus Homo. It is markedly different from an ape hip. While examining a cast of the hip bone, composite of MH1 and MH2, Elabin couldn't help but notice its striking resemblance to that of modern human. It does look homo-like. This is in agreement with published papers in science. For example, De, for instance, De Silva and colleagues described the pelvis attributed to Sediba as human-like. In the science paper that focused specifically on the hip bones, evolutionary paleoanthropologist Kibi and colleagues report the pelvis of early Pleistocene Homo share with modern humans a suite of features. Many of these features are seen in the pelvic remains of two fairly complete individuals of Australopithecus sediba from Malapa. Uh, Christopher Ruff says some stuff which we'll omit, and then Lee Berger himself, the discoverer, or the father of the discoverer, said, but the fossils also show some surprisingly modern traits usually found only in members of our genius. The two pelvises in particular are capacious and elongated, resembling those of Homo. To explain Sidiba's human-looking hip bone that appears far too modern for an Australopith, the researchers assumed that the pelvis must have rapidly evolved while the other bones lagged behind. Well, as we'll see, there one other se section of it uh, apparently rapidly evolved, and the jaw was in the middle of rapidly evolving. Um, again, they described the phenomenon as mosaic as acquisition of traits. However, a more reasonable explanation for the surprisingly modern hip bone is that it belonged to a member of our own genus, not because Sediba was evolving in a mosaic fashion. Sediba's rib cage is ape. The human-like hip not only influenced the researchers' claim that Sidiba was a pitiful upright walker, 
it also influenced their interpretation of the rib cage, the thorax. The rib cage of Sediba was reconstructed with what Berger and researchers described as a mosaic morphology, looking partly human and partly ape, and convenient anatomy for an alleged transitional form. Schmidt and colleagues discussed this in science, writing, the thoracic shape of Australopithecus sediba thus appears to be an unusual combination of the primitive condition of an ape-like upper thorax, thoracic shape with a more derived human-like shape to the lower thorax. They note the overall shape of the upper thorax of Australopithecus sediba is clearly more ape-like. However, the lower rib cage was supposedly human-like that was supposedly human-like, could not be reconstructed due to the fragmentary nature of the remains. All that was recovered from the lower thorax was a single small rib fragment, which was arguably human-like in structure. How then can they be confident that the lower rib was, the cage was barrel-shaped like in humans? The honest answer is they cannot. But the researchers, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff as you can see, but the researchers understood that an ape-like lower rib cage could, would not be compatible with a surprisingly modern looking hip. That would be an anatomical contradiction. The researchers acknowledged that the inferred human-like barrel-shaped reconstruction of the lower rib cage was primarily influenced by the human-shaped hip. Schmidt and colleagues explained their reasoning. In both apes and humans, there is correspondence between the shapes of the inferior rib cage and the false pelvis formed by the iliac blades. Thus, the derived human-like vertical reorientation and greater curvature of the iliac blades of Australopithecus sediba lead us to suggest that its lower thoracic ship, shape, or rib cage, could not be like that of an ape, because it's on top of a human pelvis. It is true that there's an anatomical correspondence between the shape of the lower rib cage and the iliac blades of the hip bone as well as muscle attachments between them. But in consideration of the mismatched jaw bones and the mismatched vertebra, it seemed likely that the human-shaped hip bone was also mistakenly associated with the remains of MH1 and MH2. If Sediba reflects a mixture of homo and australopith bones, then it is not surprising the reconstruction of the lower hip rib cage was made to appear human, barrel-shaped, especially if it was modeled based on mismatched human hip bones. Sediba's upper limbs are ape. Recovered remains of the upper limbs attached, assigned to MH1 and MH2 include an assortment of complete and fragmentary bones, clavicles, humeri, ulna, radius, scapula, etc. In this suite of bones, there is no evidence of a mosaic assemblage of primitive and derived traits. Experts in the field are largely in agreement on this point, consistent with a funnel-shaped upper thorax, the upper limb, limb bones attributed to Sediba are unmistakably ape-like, revealing an anatomy perfectly suited for tree-dwelling life. Um, Stephen Churchill says some stuff that I'm omitting. If Sediba, well actually uh, this is part of it, if Sediba is truly the immediate ancestor to upright walking members of our genus Homo, why does it have an upper limb anatomy that indicates it spent most of its life in the trees. This conflicts with De Silva and Burgess' claim that Australopithecus sediba was a habitual biped, an upright walker. Well, but see, it had a human hip, so it had to be. You know, it gets interesting. Schmidt and colleagues say some stuff. Berger writes further that sediba had, uh, I forgot to put those in green, okay. Berger writes further that Sediba had longer, more ape-like arms. Popular science writer Anne Gibbons summarizes the anatomy of the upper limbs in an article in Science. The other new papers in Science tackle different parts of the anatomy, such as the shoulder and arm, which are primitive and chimp-like. The shoulder and the long arm show that Australopithecus Sediba was still spending a lot of time climbing trees. But Sediba has a human hand. Paleo expert Stephen Churchill describes the hand and wrist attributed to the adult female as hyperhuman, not just human. Berger described the hand similarly. Sediba's hand is hauntingly similar to the, that of modern humans, with a fully opposable thumb. A chimpanzee's hand is excellent for grasping and swinging from trees. Sediba's hand could hold and use small objects. 
Researchers were surprised to find such a modern looking hand from what they believed to be a 1.9 million year old Australopithecus. Humans have a longer thumb and shorter fingers when compared to apes, and we're going to see that figure in a minute. However, the perfectly human hand of Sediba is incompatible with the distinctive ape-like anatomy of the upper limbs. Uh, why do you have human hands if you're going to be swinging from the trees? If Sediba swung through the trees, it could not do so with human hands. And now you can see the long fingers here, thin. Uh, remember that the chimpanzee is smaller than a human, so the hand is proportionally larger, actually. A uh, human, uh, a little more stout. Um, and here's Sediba. Now there's four bones that are missing there. We have one at the tip of the thumb, but we don't have the other four bones. So keep that in mind while you're in off. So we're missing, whoops. We're also missing the um, a uh, couple of bones in the wrist. I'm sure they belong there, we just don't have them. Human hands give us the unique ability to grip and carefully manipulate ob objects between the thumb and fingers. Stone tools were recovered from the Malapa site. So Sidiba made stone tools, maybe? Um, where the remains of MH1 and MH2 were found. However, the stone tools were not found in C2, and so maybe they got washed in, who knows. Um, so the researchers have not drawn any conclusions as to whether they were used by Sediba. But in consideration of the mismatched fossils that demonstrate Sediba is a mixture of two different species, and it's therefore a false taxon, it stands to reason that the hand of MH2 and the stone tools belong together, representing our genus Homo. Prior to Sediba, the most complete hand dating to the same time period was assigned to Homo habilis. Habilis's recovered hand bones in OH7 were said to display a human-like morphology and were associated with stone tools. Interestingly, the hand bones attributed to MH2 appears to be even more human-like than those of Habilis. With this in mind, it is surprising that researchers do not credit Sediba with the same tool-making ability. Cavell, writing in the Journal of Science, comments on this writing. Australopithecus sediba reveals that many of the manual morphological features commonly associated with stone tool production, even if Australopithecus sediba itself was not a stone tool maker, were present by 1.977 million years, basically 2 million years old. And most of these features are not present in OH7. In the light of this, Australopithecus sediba may provide a better potential morphotype for basal homo hand morphology than the hand fossils originally used to define the species Homo habilis. I can hear Johansson yelling, stop that. Despite the overall similarity of the hand bones of MH2 to humans, the researchers have been reluctant to describe sediba with tool making. Why? The reason is because the ape-like anatomy of the upper limbs of Sediba is not compatible with the tool-making hominid. The, you just plop the human hands on the ape arms. Long arms and chimpanzee-like upper thorax useful for su suspensory behavior does not fit well with tool-making abilities. Although, you know, I suppose they could. Uh, another apparent anatomical contradiction. Cavell and colleagues explain and I'm going to skip their explanation, it's in the book. But if Sediba is a mixture of bones from the two different genera, then it is reasonable that the hand bones belong in the genus Homo and the ape-like upper limb belonging to an Australopith. This very nicely explains why the hand bones are described as hyperhuman and why the upper, limit, why the upper limb is considered like that of a chimpanzee. Because they're actually two different animals. Um, Sediba's skull and brain case are ape. When considering any putative ancestor er to early man, there's a temptation for paleo experts to highlight certain traits that might suggest an evolutionary vector towards a human condition. The skull and endocast, or brain case, attributed to Sediba is no exception. Yet the Sediba cranium and endocast, endocast are fully ape and resists efforts to humanize Sediba. I think that uh, that should be resist. This makes it difficult to argue that the skull represents anything other than an ordinary ape. 
A partial cranium found at the Malapa site was assigned to the juvenile skeleton, MH1. The cranial capacity was small, about 420 centimeters, within the range of chimps. That's actually low, as we'll see. But as we learn from Hobbit and Erectus and modern humans, cranial capacity is not a definitive taxonomic indicator. So they're being fair in the book, at least trying to. Um, let's not just jump to conclusions based on the small skull, a small brain. Uh, in Berger's own assessment of the skull, the closest morphological comparison for Australopithecus is Sediba. Uh, Australopithecus, Sediba is Australopithecus Africanus, as these taxa share numerous similarities in the cranial volute, facial skeleton, mandible, and teeth. Yet Berger points out other features that differ from Australopithecus afferens, uh, Africanus. I'm going to skip over some of that stuff. In the Journal of Human Evolution, William Kimball and G.L. Rack reject Berger's claim that Sediba skull is derived towards the human condition, writing, We argue that MH1 provides clear evidence that Australopithecus sediba was uh, uniquely related to Australopithecus africanus, that is an extinct Australopithecine ape, and that the hypothesis of an extensive ghost lineage connecting Australopithecus sediba to the root of the homo clade is unwarranted. <coughs> Speaking about the endocast, um, that's the inside of the skull that shows where the brain uh, uh, sulci were. Um, Dean Falk, an evo a leading evolutionary paleoneurologist and expert in human and primate brains and cognition, states, explains that there are only two types of, two places in the brain where humans and apes differ markedly. The first, uh, I'm not going to discuss because unfortunately that part of the skull of MH1 was missing. So you can't tell that one. But the second is really probably the best distinguishing feature. Another large groove known as the frontooccipital sulcus, uh, FO for short, located toward the front of the brain in apes but not present in humans. And it's gonna, you're going to see why in a minute. As reported in the journal Frontiers in Human Neuroscience, chimpanzee brains, and indeed those of all great apes, have a frontoorbital sulcus not seen in human brains. In place of the ape uh, FO, humans have two smaller grooves that make up a triangular region, or pars triangularis, called Broca's area, which plays an essential role in speech and language. You have a stroke in Broca's area, you can't talk. Moving on, a, a quoting, a distinct frontal orbital sulcus incises the lateral margin of the left inferior frontal lobe. This is a primitive condition that is present in apes, is primitive, therefore a sediba is primitive. A primitive condition that is present in apes and, southern, and some other South African australopiths, but not typically expressed in homo. Also similar to endocasts of apes and other australopiths, the MH1 endocast exhibits no evidence of Broca's area. Again, that's the speech area. In this respect, the inferior frontal region of MH1 clearly appears more ape-like than human-like. Uh, quoting National Geographic, pronounced asymmetry between right and left brain, and I guess yeah, those should be green too. Um, le right and left brain hemispheres is a hallmark of humans because our cerebrum has become specialized, with the left side more involved in language. On that side, Carlson sees hints of a protrusion in the region of Broca's area. Yeah, if you imagine, you can think maybe it's getting a little more of a bulge. A part of the brain linked to language processing in modern humans. But Dean Falk from the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe an expert on fossil endocast adds the caution that Broca's area is defined by specific creases in the brain and it would be quite a reach to identify it based only on a bulge. There are other criticisms that are listed. Moreover, in the study of, by Carlson and colleagues in science, the endocast of Sediba was compared to just two other Australopithecine endocasts, STS-5 and STS-60. 
they excluded other Australopithecine endocasts that are more variable. It looks like classic way of trying to show that uh, your stuff is different from other stuff to take a, a constricted range. In a follow-up study in the uh, journal Frontiers in Human Neuroscience, Falk included an additional Australopithecine endocast, the Tong child, for further comparison, for further comparative analysis of MH1's endocast. In her analysis, it appears that all of the Australopithecine endocasts that reproduce sulci in the frontal lobes have similar sulcal patterns. There are still more problems. Compared to other Australopithecine specimens, the brain size of Zediba is noticeably smaller, not larger. Skipping on a little further, uh, they mentioned Sediba's puzzling mixed bone bed. The Sediba bones were buried in a mixed bone bed with thousands of other bones from at least 18 different species, including primates. So if the, you had Homo and Australopithecus at the same time, it would be quite reasonable to find them buried together along with all the other bones. Conclusion, Sediba is a jumble of Homo and Australopithecus australopithecus bones. The bones that have been called Sediba do not appear to represent a transitional form at all. What Berger and colleagues reconstructed is not a new species, but rather appears to be a chimeric skeleton, a mixture of human and non-human bones. It is not uncommon for paleo experts to unintentionally mix bones belonging to different species. This is especially true when they are highly motivated to find an in-between creature. Berger admits that this was always his lifelong ambition. Berger, like his role model, Donald Johansson, uh, seems to have spent a lifetime chasing after the honor of finding the, the missing link that would validate human evolution. Given a jumble of bones from all kinds of African animals, including apes and men, all found in one small pit, and given a strong desire to discover an in-between ape-human skeleton, it is easy to see how bones and bone fragments might be assembled to resemble an incomplete ape-man skeleton. This explains why some of Sediba's bones appear distinctly ape, while others appear distinctly human. Berger and colleagues repeatedly referred to Sediba as a mosaic of primitive, or ape-like, or derived human-like traits. Some bones were distinctly ape, whereas others were distinctly human. The researcher's explanation for the mishmash of traits is that Sediba is a snapshot of ape evolving into man. However, a number of leading paleoanthropologists, such as Bernard Wood, John L. Johansson, and others, although remember John L. Johansson has his uh, own ax to grind there, reject this re view of Sediba. Other paleo experts argue that Sediba is an artificial species, the accidental mixture of human and non-human bones. This would mean that Sediba is essentially the same as Apelles, which we discussed last week, an artificial taxon consisting of a loose connection of human and ape bones. Evolutionary paleo experts Ella Bean and Yoel Rock of Tel Aviv University hold this view and show that the Sediba lumbar vertebrae and jawbones derive from two different genera, Australopithecus and Homo. Based on this evidence, Bean and Rock claim that Sediba is not a legitimate hominin ancestor, but is actually a combination of Australopithecus and Homo bones. This explains why the discovery team was so puzzled over how it was possible for Sediba to have a suite of bones with what were described as anatomical contradictions. That is, the upper limb and shoulder anatomy just like arboreal dwelling orangutans, but with hands indistinguishable from modern humans. This is certainly not the first time paleo experts have mixed human bones with ape bones to create the appearance of an ape man. The most famous example of this was the Piltdown Man, which was just an ape jaw that was force-fitted to a human skull with a little filing to go with it. Unlike Sediba, Piltdown Man was a deliberate scientific fraud. The bones of Piltdown Man received the same type of popular acclaim as Sediba and for decades was lifted up by many prestigious scientists as being the best evidence for, of human evolution. You had to live through that time to appreciate that. Um, after Piltdown Man was discredited, the bones called Homo habilis took center stage. See chapter eight. Um, 
arguably Sadiba is really just Habilis renamed. Sadiba was given the same time frame as Habilis and was placed in the same position within the hominin family tree, directly prece uh, preceding erectus. Most significantly, Habilis bones were extracted from mixed bone beds and resulted in a chimeric mixture of ape and human bones. Exactly the same can be said of Sadiba. As this book goes to press, much of the buzz surrounding Sadiba as a candidate ancestor to the genus Homo has gone silent. A science article published in 2017, that's the year the book was published, carried the headline, A Famous Ancestry May Be Ousted from the fam Human Family Tree, referring to Sadiba. Ann Gibbon summarizes a recent analysis presented by Bill Kimball at the annual meeting for the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Working together with Yoel Rock, Kimball noted, notes that Sadiba, the MH1 juvenile skull, shares a striking resemblance to an already recognized species, Australopithecus africanus, and is therefore not our ancestor. We do not believe that Australopithecus sediba has a unique relationship to the genus Homo. Bernard Wood, who has always been skeptical of sediba, wholeheartedly agreed with Kimball's analysis, as did Ian Tattersall. Gibbon said it best, a remarkably complete skeleton introduced in 2010 as the best candidate for the immediate ancestor of our genus Homo may just be a pretender. Team leader John Hawks and hmm, I have to look at and even Discovery Lee Berger himself appear to have given up on Sadiba. As Hawks reflect, it's not everything the rumors uh, Mill said it was going to be. It's not a missing link. And that's 107 that I should have raised up there. From the beginning, the paleo community was suspicious of Berger's sensationalized claim and has since dismissed Sadiba as a credible transitional bridge species to early Homo. An article in National Geographic by science writer James Shreve captures the current sentiment of the paleo community regarding the claims made about Sadiba. Though the doyens of paleoanthropology credited him with a jaw-dropping find, most dismissed his interpretation of it. Australopithecus Sadiba was too young, too weird, and not in the right place to be ancestral to Homo. It wasn't one of us. In a sense, neither was Berger. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Since then, prominent researchers have published papers on early Homo that didn't even mention him or his find. On the heels of disappointment with his discovery of Sadiba, Berger stumbled upon yet another remarkable finding hidden deep within a South African cave. In 2015, Berger announced to the world his latest claim to a, of a new almost human species, which he named, he's named Homo naledi. See the next chapter, which we'll discuss next week. Could naledi be the long sought after transitional bridge species to link Australopith and man, or will the middle forever remain muddled? Or if, if these, this analysis of those two species is correct, Will the middle ever forever remained missing? Now, the, I think the chapter makes a convincing argument that Australopithecus sediba is a mixed taxon. You can, if you really try hard, try to make, uh, make it work. There are, seem to be bones with ape-like characteristics and bones with human-like characteristics. And sometimes, in different skeletons, one will have one and one will have the other and then they'll flip. Um, one can insist that they're all from the same creature, but I think that that insistence is theory driven and it is entirely rational to separate them. Remember the Bush theory of evolution. The Bush theory of human evolution is okay, but in order to make it work, you have to have a main stem. Common descent requires absolutely requires that some population had continuous ancestor descendant relationships between apes and humans. That's the definition of common descent. And you can have a straight line as in the traditional picture with apes continuing or perhaps moving slightly in a different direction. You can have a more branch tree that kind of with maybe some cross 
fertilization there at times. Uh, again, with apes continuing, with perhaps branches coming off of it and living for various times. You can have something here where um, suddenly it jumps and now, unless you fossilize these, you'll never find them. That's the Gould model. Um, and the one thing you cannot have is two different lines that uh, perhaps have some branches off of them. Um, the only way that will fit with common descent is if you have some kind of a um, branch that uh, goes up to where the humans are before that. If you can show, and we're going to get to that question, that humans go back five or six million years, then the branch has to go off further and looking for it in here is hopeless. Or perhaps there is no branch and maybe it was creationism all the way. Now, uh, we've been putting, uh, um, we've been putting Neanderthal man either here or here, it's very close to human. In fact, in terms of brain case, it's actually slightly larger than human. Um, you can put uh, Homo erectus either here or here. You can put Homo floresiensis right there or there. You can put um, Australopithecus uh, afarensis there or perhaps there. You can put Australopithecus um, or pardon me, Ardipithecus ramidus, either there or there. But so far we really don't have anything in the middle. Um, their argument is that Homo habilis and Homo, uh, pardon me, Homo sediba both are mixtures of Australopithecines and humans. which could fit in either one. Again, we're missing the middle. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. It's on the face of it, being ignoramus as I am about scientific things, it would seem like if I believed in evolution that part some human aspects with some ape aspects would be the perfect answer to uh, a, um, what do you call it, intermediary. Or so what, but the evolutionists, paleontologists, you know, the experts have rejected that by and large, it looks like. So I'm wondering what would, what do they expect to see, or do they have a picture in their mind of what they would expect to see if it is a true intermediary? Well, is part of the problem is that question? they don't really know what they're expecting to see. Oh, okay. Um, and um, uh, because there's, there's uh, you know, there was a time when they did think that the brain came first and then all the other changes came afterwards which was why Piltdown Man was so successful, because it fit into the theories of the time. You had a, you had a human skull with an ape jaw. And uh, then people started saying, no, it shouldn't be that way. And that's about the time that the Piltdown uh, Man got more critical look at it and people realized that the tooth had been filed and it had been stained and uh, um, uh, both, I think it was orangutan jaws what they had, uh, that they, uh, uh, it, it was coincidental that the, where the jaw met the skull wasn't there so you couldn't tell whether it actually fit together or not. Um, I guess it's an, a good illustration of how if you want to believe something badly enough you'll take partial evidence and, and run with it. Um, but 
most evolutionists will say, well, whatever happened, happened, and it's our job to find it out, rather than trying to say, well, we know how it worked. Uh, and, you know, part of the appeal of these kinds of intermediate creatures is, well, you know, this is what we found. Of course, if you're saying, well, this is what we found, and, you know, they were laying all together, then, then you'd have a better case for it. But if you find, you know, a hand over here and a rib over here and a, and a pelvis over here and a skull over in the other direction, and you just say, well, you know, they were close, uh, then it depends on how badly you want to believe that they're all the same creature, whether you put them all together. Uh, go ahead and comment, and we have a comment back, or unless you will have one. Um. This to me is a, a sobering uh, account uh, because it tells you uh, probably more about human sociology than it does about science, uh, at least anthropology. I don't know where you're going to classify it. And, uh, <coughs> sociology, but but uh, it reminds me of the statement uh, be careful, young man, you may find what you're looking for. And uh, I'm not sure that it's just anthropologists that are uh, subject to that temptation. I think we all are. I think we all can learn a very good lesson from this. And that is, uh, don't get too endeared with your private theories. Uh, you know, as they say, uh, some theories don't pass, don't, don't, don't get changed till uh, certain people die. Uh, we need to be careful. We need to be careful and understanding of, of this, although this is an extreme case that I, I have a little bit of trouble developing too much sympathy for. for uh, but I do see a, a signal of caution here. Uh, going back to Lucy, no one is disputing that the bones of Lucy came from one individual. Is that right? I wasn't here when we covered yeah, the Lucy chapter. Yeah, that's, I think that's a fair statement that, that there's very little dispute. You have to be a little bit careful because one of the bones actually came from a monkey. So, uh, Well, they quickly discovered they, that. They discovered that. Sure. I, I don't know historically exactly how quickly, yeah. but in any well, case. Well, I think it's obvious you have a mosaic of two different species. Um, what might concern me, I want to wait till the very end to hear what, he, what the authors say in the last chapter. It seems like they use the term human and homo with a very broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. And it's def defined how paleoanthropologists use it. I think they're treading on dangerous ground when they use homo the way paleoanthropologists use it. It's a very broad category. And the reason that paleoanthropologists want to make it as broad as possible, they want to stretch it so they can come to an intermediary link. Yeah. So there's a, there's a method in their madness, and I, I, don't, I hope the authors have not fallen into that trap, but we'll see. Yeah, well actually that's, a, that's an excellent point in that uh, from the standpoint of this, the usual paleoanthropological community, um, having a broad definition for, for homo is a feature, not a bug. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to be really technical, if you're an evolutionist, there really is no division. It just kind of smoothly grades from one to the other. And so uh, separating hum homo from, you know, apes of any kind is easy now, but supposedly at one time it wasn't. And so, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful about that. 
Now, I think what's going to be interesting is to ask the question, do we find Homo, maybe even Homo sapiens sapiens, um, back before this? And that's one of the reasons why those footprints in Crete are so important, is because what they suggest is that the tree goes back all the way there. And so looking for uh, an intermediate in the last two or three years may not be a valid exercise even if you were an evolutionist. Because who says there were intermediates at that point? Maybe the intermediates were back further and we're just not looking in the right place. Yes? We understand that the giraffe got his long neck because of a preference for tree leaves, but what would account for the shortening of an ape's arm. Actually, I was corrected on, or somebody else was corrected on that in a discussion that I was watching um, uh, by uh, an evolutionist, and they've, they've given up on the idea of tree leaf uh, reaching for the highest trees, because for one thing, that means the females would starve because they're a foot and a half shorter. Um, and um, <coughs> The, uh, the other, uh, the other pro uh, and so now what it is, is the males use their necks for battling each other. Don't ask, okay. So how does the bone shorten, like from ape to man, arm bone? Um, well, you're not using it for sing swinging through the trees, so it kind of Lamarckianized. I, you know, you're asking, you're asking questions that that uh, you're not supposed to, but um, no, it's it is an interesting question. Uh, why would if you've got longer arms? I mean, I would, I, I'm sure that there are uh, uh, people today, more women probably than men, that could really use some extra long arms to reach that top shelf. Um, and so, yeah. There, there are probably a few basketball players who'd like to have longer arms. And uh, there are a few of them who do have longer arms and they're remarked upon. And, and they, they're really nice if you're trying to block a dunk. Muhammad Ali had longer arms than most boxers. Yes, Muhammad Ali had mo longer arms than most boxers, which meant that they, he, could, he could hit you while still being safe himself. So that, that made a difference. Yes, comment. Well, I was just thinking, you know, the last few gener last few years, how everything has gotten to be the age of the narrative. You know, how we've always been fighting about the narrative between creation and evolution, naturalistic evolution. But now it seems like everybody's getting into the act. You get all these points of facts around and then you invent a narrative that fits it all. And then you wait till something fact comes up that doesn't fit the narrative, but then you just change it a little bit, and that's how it goes. And it just seems like this just happens all the time. We're hardly even getting to the truth anymore because all you have to do is come up with a better narrative. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an interesting point. And supposedly the narratives are supposed to arrive out of all the facts. Sort of like you look at the dots and they almost connect themselves. Yeah, but they don't have to. But they don't I have mean, to. That's, that's, that's right. your That's your work is to get people to think this way and you come up with a narrative that'll, yeah. that'll and then you remember the narrative and you, you, you bundle all these facts according to that narrative and that's how you keep mm -hmm. it in your brain. Well, in a way, what I did at the very last slide before the, before the discussion slide was, that, uh, was to try to put it into you know, various narratives to let you know, you know what is being argued because I think that it does make a difference how you, how you make the narrative. Uh, in a way, this is all about narratives. It seems to me that no matter what the discipline is, that a person who is not part of the guild, so to speak, of that discipline, like a physician or a teacher or somebody else that has to go through certain steps to be part of the guild, 
they are recognized as the authorities there. Well, the problem for somebody like me, who is not a member of all those guilds, is trying to make sense of it in a way that's not going to impact my life. So for example, when we go back through the history of medicine, there are some things that were the consensus that if we did them today, we'd be dead. And it, it, they were extremely dangerous. Well, today, we still have access or in addition, we have access to the research by the various researchers. We can go to any major library and read everything that people are writing about a particular topic, but they don't all agree. And so as a person, at some point, I have to say, this makes the most sense to me, and here's how I choose to live my life whether it's medically or educationally or theologically or whatever, because I personally have not found a single authority or a single narrative that is consistent and that will cause me to uh, order my life after that. And after this long rambling thing, <laughs> I actually collect books on various topics that I'm interested in and compare them with what I'm being told by the authorities that are trying to control my life. And often they're so widely different. So I don't think there's going to ever be a place where we can say, we've got it all now. In anything, in any topic, in medicine, in science, in research, there is no end point. Yes, Jack. It's fascinating to listen. Uh, I would say competing narratives is the stuff of which not only science is done, but any good interchange of ideas. There's nothing wrong with competing narratives. What's wrong is when people come to believe them as the only narrative. Uh, a mantra I used in working with Adventist young, science young people over and over again is that in our unique approach to this as Adventists, that if we could find a general theme, and, and it's kind of possible that you could get close to one, I'd always tell them when we all agree 100%, we can be sure of one thing, and that is we're all wrong. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there is safety in competing narratives. In yeah, as a matter of fact, I remember uh, and during medical school being told by more than one professor that uh, uh, half of what you're being told is wrong. Uh, the problem is we don't know which half. <laughs> uh, I went through my graduate work in the decade following Sputnik. And the decade when all of the Nobel Prizes were coming out for molecular science, et cetera. And uh, my major professor, who was pretty good that way, said, what I'm telling you is probably 50% is wrong. And I'm kind of aware of that. What bothers me is that there's another 50% I think is right, and it isn't. And there's 50% that I think may be wrong that it's going to turn out to be correct. Because within 10 years of my teaching career, I was teaching stuff that I only heard of in graduate courses. I was teaching at the freshman level. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so I think we've covered seven uh, different species so far in the series. I, I think that's right, yeah. Um, it seems to me as though um, when you have essentially a single example within a species, then I think that's problematic because how do you know if it's mixture bones or whatnot, uh, for right. example? Right. Um, so we had two this time. Okay. <laughs> and that makes it even weirder because, like I say, the female has the, what is it, the ape spine in the human jaw where the male has the human jaw or the human spine in the ape jaw and it's like that's mosaic evolution with a vengeance <laughs> right right uh, can can uh, 
by, by way of review, can you list the different Australopithecus and, and Homo species and, and how many examples we have in each? Okay. Well, Neanderthals are all over. Like we but, probably have dozens? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's probably reasonable. And, and uh, most people are, ter are completely convinced now, because we have DNA, that they're essentially human. Um, I mean, you could argue that they're kind of almost on the way to human, but if they are that, w that good, they're like um, well over 95% on the way to human. Okay, so, uh, and, and uh, they could interbreed with us, so let's just, you know, forget that. Homo erectus is a little bit more dicey, smaller brain, and that's probably the thing that bothers me the most, but then, I mean, outside of that, how, how now that we've seen what human it looks like compared with ape, you know, with the toes, the big toes being long and straight and out, uh, Homo erectus, for example, could easily have left human-type footprints. Homo erectus had human-type hands. Um, really, the only complaint is the, is the size of the brain. Um, and so, so how many Homo erectus uh, examples do we have? Well, let's see, it's Java man, which is uh, three pieces. There's Peking man, which disappeared during World War II, so we don't really know exactly how much of what was there. Um, there's Peking man, that's how old it is, and instead <laughs> of Beijing man. Um, there's um, uh, probably some of the Africans, uh, Homo ergaster probably belongs there. Um, uh, I would say you're probably looking at maybe 10 or 15 total. Uh, that's a ballpark estimate and there are people who might be able to give you a better one. And, and these are, are mostly partial skeletons? Mostly partial skeletons. They're, they're pretty, pretty, I mean, they look like we got stuff with only one species there. It doesn't look like the, uh, for example, the uh, uh, Homo habilis or the, or the uh, Australopithecus and um, Sediba. It's not anywhere near that kind of mix. And, and Australopithecus? Australopithecus, well, it depends on which Australopithecus. You know, the interesting thing is that uh, there's Australopithecus boise, there's Australopithecus, uh, used to be Ardu, uh, Ardu, uh, um, Afarensis and Africanus, and uh, so you, you, there's there's several different varieties of Australopithecines, uh, some of which are more robust than others, and um, although we don't have a lot of complete skeletons, we have a lot of specimens, particularly skulls, that uh, there. There's probably, oh, I don't know, t maybe 10 complete skulls, more or less, in that area uh, of the various Australopithecines, or semi-complete skulls. So uh, you have some sense of the, of the spread, and there is a considerable spread in the Australopithecines. So, yeah, the, 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 the ones that need to be, you know, in the middle are the ones that are really hard to find. And, you know, it's arguable that, that maybe there aren't any in the middle, really. And that's the argument that's being made here. Now, I don't think that, again, I don't think that creationism stands or falls on that. And I think that we can afford to be as objective as we possibly can. Um, uh, some of our creationist colleagues are 
convinced that if there ever was any kind of cross breeding between apes and humans that uh, creationism falls. I'm not sure that it does because I'm not sure that's the central point. Um, but uh, you know I, I think that well it's it's like how we approach the Bible okay we approach the Bible with an at least the attempt to be as open as possible to whatever the best interpretation is there. Best interpretation partly depending on the unification of the Bible, but mostly depending on looking at the text and trying to understand it. And not trying to force a, an interpretation that we had uh, ahead of time. And I think that's why uh, you know, Adventists in particular have found that the Seventh-day Sabbath seems to be part of the biblical record is because we were, we were kind of ripped out of our culture of moorings in 1844 and then had to basically kind of reinvent the wheel. When we did, we came up with some things that were closer to the original. That, at least that's my reading of how it worked. Um, and I think that if we're doing science, we need to do kind of the same kind of thing. You, you know, you ask, well, what's the standard theory? Okay, fine. What is the basis for that theory? Uh, what are the things that have been, had to have been put on the shelf? Is there any way that we can fit it using a slightly or perhaps a greatly modified theory? Uh, narrative is really another word for historical theory. That's what it really is. Does that answer the question, sort of? Yeah. Well, in that case, um, why don't we come back next week and we'll talk about Homo uh, naledi, uh, which is, like I say, fascinating story. Uh, and he's really going to stretch homo on this one. Uh, the question is, uh, do you think he stretches it until it breaks? Uh, no, I'll tell you, he doesn't think it's a mosaic. And these are skeletons that are all found in one place and without. Yes.